Welcome everyone to our Cultivate Night of Worship, man. We are so excited that you are here. Would you stand to your feet? Man, we have been praying and preparing for you to come and just have this time to be together and to worship God. I know you guys have prepared, dropping off kids, fighting that traffic, whatever you had to do to get here tonight. We're so glad you're here. But you know what I know above that is that God has prepared to meet us here tonight. He is ready to pour out His Spirit on this place. He is ready to minister to us as we minister to His heart and worship. So whatever you brought in the doors tonight, whether you're in a season of gratitude and favor and blessing over your life, I'm gonna ask you, would you sing a little louder tonight? Because the woman right next to you might need to borrow your faith. Because I also know that there's some of us in this room who are probably not okay. And we're, we're heavy have burdens that we carry, but Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, all who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest for your souls. That's what we're going to ask for tonight. So would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you in your presence. We say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you fill this place? As we open our hearts to you, we're ready to receive
power. You know, when we magnify who God is and what he has done, his character, when we shine a light on that with our worship, we not only honor him, but we also minimize the voice of the enemy. When we exalt the power of our God, we minimize the voice of our enemy, the lies we might be believing, the anxiety, the worry, the strongholds that are in our lives. And that's what we're doing tonight. You know, Psalm 150, it says this beautiful, beautiful call to worship. It says, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise God in his house of worship. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power, for his miracles. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. We're gonna praise him with trumpets blasting. We're gonna praise him with a piano and with a guitar. We're gonna praise him with drums and with dancing and with cymbals. Let everyone, everywhere join in the crescendo of ecstatic praise to Jesus.
freedom in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. You know, when our lives intersect, we have an encounter with Jesus. We're changed. We don't have to always understand it. Sometimes it's too holy for words. But we're changed. One of my favorite passages in scripture is about a woman who had an encounter with Jesus. One of these accounts is in the book of Mark chapter 14. We don't know her full story and, and all that Jesus did for her in totality, but the experience that she had with God, the love that he showed her, moved her to a radical act of worship. The text tells us that she enters into a room where Jesus is sitting and he's reclining and he's having a meal. And she comes before him and she breaks open this alabaster box of probably what was the most precious and valuable thing to her in her world. And she pours it out at the feet of Jesus as her offering of worship. And she kisses his feet. She dries her tears with his hair, her hair because she's so moved by the compassion and the power and the healing of Jesus. You know, I think sometimes for us, we, we come before him and we know what to give. We have an offering of praise or we have an offering of gratitude or thankfulness, but sometimes we have something different and it's heavy and it's weighty and it's our anxiety, it's our fear, it's our worry. It's that loved one who's not getting well. But what I love about Jesus is that he takes it all. He takes everything that we have to give and he welcomes it right at his feet. And as we continue to worship and just even sing this next song, I wanna ask you this question tonight. What do you need to break open before your king, before Jesus tonight? What do you wanna thank him for? Maybe there's something of gratitude you wanna pour out, but maybe it's a wound. Maybe it's something that has actually clogged your soul, unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy. And there's an invitation tonight to break that open at the feet of Jesus and let him minister to you, let him see you, let him love you. So as we sing this, I just want to encourage you just to open your heart, let the Holy Spirit show you, and then respond in a way that feels genuine.
like this in scripture, it says that when we sing to Jesus, we're casting up highways in heaven. That means he's riding in on this praise right now. He's riding in on this praise right now. And when we think about this story, this woman who was in front of Jesus, she didn't open the seal to this flask, she broke it. And in scripture, there's this Greek word, it says suntribo, and I was learning a little bit about it, and it's not just that she broke it, it actually means she shattered it. She shattered that thing into pieces to release the worship that her God was worthy of. It was a costly offering. It was a vulnerable moment to shatter this thing in front of her, to give it to Jesus. And there's a worship inside of us that is only unleashed when we shatter what needs to be shattered in our lives. There's a seal. There's a seal that can be broken to unleash a new kind of worship to our King, our King of Kings. If that's anxiety, if that's worry, if that's fear, if that's pride, right now is the moment to give it to God, to shatter it before His feet and lay it as you're offering to Him. Because there's a new gratitude, there's a new worship that follows right up after that. So if you would join me, let's shout out those, those barriers. Let's shout out, let's shatter that. Let's worship our God. gather on night side tonight, we, we don't just come and worship and pour out our gratitude to God, but we also, it, it cultivated a tradition to be able to share the goodness of God with those around us, to bring that as part of our offering of worship. And tonight we're going to do the same. You know, we're partnering with three nonprofits in our community who are all about our vision of cultivative, showing exceptional kindness in our city. These nonprofits, they, they help women and children who have come out of abuse in their homes and they need to know that there's hope and that there are people who are gonna care for them in their most vulnerable moments. These are women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy and they need to know that there's compassion for them, there's love for them, that God sees them in their most vulnerable and pa painful places and so do we. So we're gonna to continue to worship. We're gonna sing of God's goodness right now. And I'm gonna invite you, if you feel moved, to just come forward and present some sort of offering into the baskets in the front. You can also give at give.se. But this is a powerful time for us to 
connect our worship vertically to God as it translates horizontally into the hurting and the lost and the broken in our communities. So let's continue to worship him, sing of his goodness.
Hey guys. I brought someone, you guys, this room, my goodness, just look around from your seat wherever you are. You don't need to be out in LA at a bar on a Friday night. You can be in the house of the Lord, right? We can get high on Jesus right up in here. Hey, I, I seriously do want to give a shout out to the band. My goodness, my goodness. And I brought someone with me tonight. Hi. <laughs> These are my friends. <laughs> and before we get started, I feel like I should tell you something. Okay. I tell my friends things. And <laughs> in case you mingle afterwards, I may have told some stories in the past. Probably not bad. Yeah. Probably embellished a little. Okay. The truth is, is I love you a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is my husband, Adam. How do you feel being at a Cultivate event, like up here, like not in the back? A little nervous for some reason, maybe, I don't know. Um, good, but man, the worship was incredible. Yeah. Like, this room was on fire. Yeah. And I couldn't stop crying, and I'm like, I'm gonna lose my voice and not be able to talk, which would probably be okay. You could Yeah, I would just take your notes, it'd be fine. Yeah. Um, they sound good, though, don't they? Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And it smells good in here. It does smell good. Better than the weekend. So, yeah. Yeah. You guys, listen, I know he's not hard to look at, but remember, I will cut, you know? I will do that. <laughs> I'm all about kindness. I'm all about it. And then sometimes I have to uh, go, I got to uh, set that uh, aside okay. and do. So I'm just letting uh, you know. Just letting uh, you know. Appreciate, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Right? Going. I chose well. Amen, sisters? I chose well. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want to do this anymore. Okay. Um, th this is my husband, Adam. We've been married for almost 22 years. Yeah. yeah, I told you guys that middle school marriages were allowed in New Jersey where I grew up. <laughs> and so high school was hard. Carrying algebra, being a wife, but I did it. I figured out how to do it. Um, but no, seriously, we've been married for 22 years, and I'm, I'm really so glad that you're here because what we're going to talk about tonight is something that is so um, important to us and has been for the last 20 years. I mean, even though we've both been followers of Jesus for longer than that, 20 years ago, these principles um, came into our lives and really changed the trajectory of our lives. And, and so for those of you who don't know, Adam is the executive pastor of discipleship here at Sandals Church. And so what we're going to talk about is super near and dear to our hearts, um, and I'm going to let you just kind of get started. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really am completely honored to be here with you guys. Tiffany Perry was asking me, have I been like on the platform before at a Cultivate event? And I said, no, normally I'm like a creeper standing in the back of the room, you know, hoping nobody notices me. But um, I'm just honored to be here and grateful to get to share with you for a little bit, both of us. Um, does anyone in here have young little children? Um, or you remember being a little child? I have, it's crazy, I have these memories of my childhood. I can't remember what I did like Tuesday, but I have these memories of when, <clears throat> when I was a little kid. Melody will send me to the store, like she'll say go to Ralph's and get these two th or three things, and I come home with 20 or 30 things, no exaggeration, and none of them are the two or three things she asked me to go get. But like I have these memories of my early childhood. And there's this, there's this one memory I have of being in kindergarten. It was a fall day in New Jersey. And uh, my class was, was playing kickball. Just outside like the, the back door of the, of the building, we were on the blacktop playing kickball. And I remember so well it was my turn to kick the ball. So I did. And, uh, and I start running, you know, as fast as, I guess, five-year-old little legs would take me. And I fall. I trip. I skin my knee. I cut my, my leg open. I rip my pants. And I remember just, like, sitting there crying and kind of hobbling off to the side of the building, just kind of getting up against the building away from everyone and just crying. And I think the teacher kind of said from a distance, you'll be okay, Adam. You know, you'll be okay. And I continued to cry. And it didn't take very long, 
for her to say to the class that was playing. Everybody stop the game. She said, stop the game. She said, I want everyone to ignore Adam because he's being a crybaby. I'm gonna need her name. I'm gonna need that name right now. (laughs) Need. She said, we ignore crybabies, which didn't help me from being a crybaby. I kept crying. Like, I remember that like it was yesterday. And I remember when she said that, I turned my attention from her in the class, the embarrassment of it all. And I looked to the corner of the building because every day my mom would come and pick me up and we'd walk home together and that's the corner she would come around. And I thought, I'm crying, I'm hurt. My mom's gotta know, right? She's gonna come around that corner and rescue me. I was alone. That was the first time as I look back into my childhood that I think I remember being alone and and being by myself and kind of isolated. There's a loneliness epidemic in the world, in our country, you know, for sure. I just was reading some statistics. 61% of young adults, 51% of mothers with young children feel serious loneliness. Those are incredibly high numbers. I remember 10 years ago, I heard a study that said, for your health, being lonely is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. But I want you to know something. Jesus is anti-loneliness. He's against it. He hates loneliness. Just think about the people that Jesus approached and the people that Jesus reached out to. He went to the marginalized. He went to the isolated. He went to the people that were alone. He pursued people that were lonely because Jesus is anti-loneliness. In fact, I wanna look at just a couple verses today to see what Jesus says about loneliness and really his antidote to loneliness, which is relationships. And I just wanna quickly look at a couple verses to see Jesus' perspective on relationships and community. So the, the, the first verse is gonna be in John 13, but before we get there, that the context of these verses is like incredibly important. The context of these verses take place. Uh, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. And listen, it's, it's literally hours before Jesus would go to the cross. Like just hours before that. He's talking with his disciples. He's preparing them for his departure. That he's gonna die and eventually he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna ascend into heaven. But he's... He's with his disciples right before he goes to the cross. So what he says here, right, last words matter. Think about if you knew you had only a few hours left to live, what would you be talking about? So whatever Jesus is about to say must be really high on his priority list. It must really matter. So John 13, 34 says this. So Jesus says, so now I'm, gi- go- now I'm giving you a new command. That's a big deal. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you a new command. You know about all the commands. I'm giving you a new one. He says, love each other. Well, that wasn't new. They heard that before. But this next part is new. He says, just as I have loved you, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. That's new. It's incredible. And we could spend, man, just so much time breaking down what does it mean to love others the way Jesus has loved us. But one thing that I think it means is think about how how did Jesus love them? He loved them as individuals. There's no question about it. He loved them individually. But I think some of the most profound experiences of the love of Jesus they had was when they were together in community. Think about this scene right now, right? Uh, They're together. For Jesus' like final hours of his life, they're together. He's washed their feet at this point together. He shared a meal with them together. He's preparing them for his departure together. He's doing all of these things in the context of these relationships of this community. And I think what Jesus is really saying, I think what he's really saying here is, you've been loved by me in community. Now go love each other in community. 
In other words, I've modeled for you what this should look like. It should look like relationships. It should look like community together. I've done that for you. Now I'm telling you, go do this. Keep going at it. Don't stop just because I'm leaving. And the incredible thing about this is that Jesus is advocating for relationships. Listen, he's advocating for relationships while um, one of his best friends, one of his closest friends, has left the dinner table. He's gotten up to go betray Jesus for some silver. Jesus is advocating. He's pro-relationships in the middle of being betrayed by a friend. He wasn't jaded. He didn't say, this doesn't work. Not to mention, the next day, all of his closest friends, listen, all of his closest friends, imagine if all of your closest friends bailed on you. That's what Jesus experiences here. And, and I just wonder, like, as you sit there and you think about, okay, relationships, community, I wonder if, if, if there's a reluctancy sometimes, maybe even in your own heart, to move forward in deep relationships, to, to kind of put yourself out there because you've been wounded. You've been betrayed, you've been hurt. Your soul has been damaged by the thing that's supposed to be a gift from God, right, relationships. Maybe you even were someone who hurt someone else. Jesus knew. He knew that community would, would be hard for us. He knew that relationships would be challenging. When he's telling them to love each other the way I loved you, he's not just kind of making a throwaway statement and thinking to himself, this is gonna be easy. He knows it's gonna be hard. And the reason I know he knows it's gonna be hard is because he prays a prayer for them about this very thing. He's telling them, love each other, and then he prays a prayer that they would do that. This is John 17, 20 and 21. This is beautiful. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, right, the, guy that's in, the guys that are in the room with him. He says, but also, for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you, that's me. He says, I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. That is so profound. There was a moment in time, it was this moment, and I'm sure he continues to, but where Jesus thought of you and he prayed for you. And what he prayed for was that you would live the life of following Jesus in the context of community with others in deep abiding relationships with one another's. It's profound, it's beautiful. He knew it would be a challenge. He experienced the joy, he experienced the pain of relationships, and he still pushed forward and engaged in these relationships. And listen, I'm not wired this way naturally. I don't know if you've told stories about me on this in this way, but I'm an introvert. Yeah, I might have told them. <laughs> like I'm a hardcore, serious introvert. Like, I've made the joke before, like that old school Tom Hanks movie where he's on the island all by himself, cast away if you've never seen that. Listen, he's all by himself. And the whole time I'm watching this movie, like, why are you trying to get off that island, man? <laughs> like, that feels so good to me. There's something that warms my soul when I think about being alone. I like all the things that I like. I don't argue with myself a whole lot. I don't have to necessarily convince someone to do something with me. I like being by myself. That's like my, my hard wiring almost is like, be alone, be alone. When the whole COVID thing's going on and they're talking about whatever, two weeks to bend the curve or whatever that saying was, I'm like, does this mean we're gonna like be in the house for the next however long? Yeah, that's what it means. This is great. This is gonna be like we're on the East Coast in a snowstorm and we can't go anywhere. Yep, that's what we you thought. We don't have to see anybody. <laughs> there's, there's something inside of me that has like this gravitational force toward isolation toward, listen, for me, privacy, to be alone. But here's the thing. I know that's not good for me. I know that me being alone will ultimately lead to my loneliness, and that's not good. That's not how Jesus wants me to live my life. As much as I'm so attracted to being alone, A faith journey without community would look unrecognizable to Jesus. It would be unrecognizable to him. If you tried to journey, if Jesus came back now and he just spent some time with you, 
and you don't have any rich, meaningful, deep transformational relationships. And he was just spending time with you to try to figure out, are you a follower of mine? I think he would question if you are a follower of his. Because in John 13, 35, he says, listen to this. He says, everyone's gonna know you're my follower by your love for each other. By the community you live in, people will know that you follow. In other words, the gospel's at stake based on how we live in community. So Jesus is saying, man, enter into deep, meaningful relationships with one another because that's how I designed this whole thing to work. Jesus designed this journey of following him to be lived in the context of community and relationship, even for us introverts, even for those of us who've been wounded by people, those of us who have wounded people. This mattered so much to Jesus, it mattered so much to him, that on his way to, man, right before, right, the, 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 the stinking phony trials and the beatings and the mockery, the, the being punched in the face and being spat upon and being teased and having a crown of thorns thrust on his head and ultimately having nails driven through his hands and feet, prior to all of that, the thing that was so close to the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of Jesus, was you and I here today living in community, and that's why he prayed that prayer. It matters so much to him. My mom um, didn't come around the corner that day. She did a few hours later at pickup time, but not in the moment. She didn't know that I was in need. Man, God has come around the corner for you. He came around the corner for you and he knows what you need. And I'm gonna tell you this, man, you don't just need him. I hear sometimes people say, all I need is God. No, no, that's not true. That's not true according to what God has said. God has made each of us with a need. He decided not to fill himself, but he wants to fill it with people around you, community. That's what he prayed for, and that's what he wants for your life. You will never be who you were meant to be on your own because you were never meant to be alone. And I get it, man, I get it. Relationships are scary, people are scary, you know? And I'm not looking at you because I'm saying you're scary. I want this to be a joyful ride home, babe. It's gonna be. <laughs> I do, though, remember a time where I was a little scary. And um, you guys know I tell you my secrets. I mean, I remember Cultivate Conference a few years ago. I showed you a picture of myself that I took on the toilet. Like, I, I should probably be more filtered is the truth. But you're my friends, and so I tell you stuff. But... You know, when we, we were, went through COVID and about January 2021, um, after just wearing masks for, for, you know, months and months, I decided it was time to do something for my skin. You know, I'm post 40 now, so my skin isn't going to help itself. And, and so I decided to get another peel. Now, the first time I had the peel done, nothing went wrong. I just wasn't prepared for my skin to peel off, which... I know I don't sound like the smartest person in the room right now, okay? Like, my esthetician was like, you understand what the word peel means, right? And I'm like, fool, I didn't know I was going to look like this, you know? But, but the second time, I was like, yeah, let, let's go deeper, you know? Let's just get all those wrinkles and hyperpigmentation, all that. And so we did. And, and so I actually got an infection. And yeah, and thank you. It, it hurt really bad. I appreciate that. And I'm glad Adam's teacher's not in the room. She'd be like, get over it. <laughs> I'd have to kick her out of Cultivate. That'd be so unlike Jesus. But, but anyway, you guys, the infection kept getting worse and worse. And, and so I'm going to show you what I look like with my infection, okay? Just take a look. You guys are super mean. I want you to know that. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, lo it hurt as bad as it looked, but I had to take those pictures because I was like, I don't know that this is the normal part of the peel, and so is this supposed to, you know, and, and it hurt, and I had to put, like, Aquaphor on it, and then I had to get an antibiotic, but here's the good deal. Okay, you can take it down. I'm getting scared again. It's, like, triggering me. 
The beauty of it was that it was during mask season. So nobody knew out in the world. I was walking my people at Target. They were thinking I was looking so good. I could have been like, bah, but I didn't. <laughs> but nobody knew that I had this awful infection because I was under a mask. And I have friends who are determined that they're never not wearing one because they just don't want to get ready anymore. They just got so used to it. I heard one person say, don't be getting engaged during COVID because you don't know what's under that mask. You, they might have nice eyes and it might be Frankenstein. You don't know. But the truth was, was there was something comforting about the fact that when I went out, no one had to know what I was really going through. No one saw me. You know, I could smile with my eyes. Even though it was painful, no one had to know that. And that's what we like about avoiding vulnerability. What we like avoiding about vulnerability is that we can walk around, even with people that we love, and we get so good at masking what's really going on inside of us. And here's why, because we've learned some lessons. We've learned people are scary. We've learned people can't be trusted. We've learned that people in the church sometimes are the worst. So what should we do? We should put a mask on and smile and show up and leave and never let anyone see what's really going on. But what happens to us if we never experience true vulnerability? What happens to you if you go through your life never really being vulnerable. Let me tell you why you should risk it. Because without knowing you and your name and your story and what you've been through and how you got here tonight and the weight that you're carrying, let me tell you something. There is a universal desire for belonging in every single one of us. In every single one of us, we're asking the question, can I be fully known and fully loved? Is there a place for me? And discovering that answer feels so scary that sometimes we're not willing to put ourselves out there and find out the truth because sometimes we are known and we aren't loved. And so we decide that's it, that's it for me. People aren't safe, I can't be vulnerable. But let me tell you why else you should risk it. Because the strongest, most self-sufficient human to ever walk the face of the earth, the person that we would all look at and say, they literally don't need anyone, modeled for us, as Adam just talked about, living in relationship. Jesus did not have to live in relationship to accomplish what God sent him here to accomplish. He didn't. What was required for the atonement of your sin and mine was his death and then his resurrection. He conquered sin. But he chose it. He chose it. And I think he chose it because he wants you to know and he wants me to know that there is a gift inside of vulnerability that he wants us to experience. Adam already talked a little bit about Jesus's mindset right before he goes to the cross. But I want to point out the worst night of his life. The worst night of his life on earth is the night that he's getting ready to go into the trial and his crucifixion. And he's tormented. Think about one of the worst nights of your life. Think about what you were feeling. Think about what you were praying. Think about who was with you. Jesus goes into the garden and it says in Matthew 26, 37 and 38, he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and listen to this, he became anguished and distressed. Listen to his words. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And then what does he say to them? Stay here and keep watch with me. I don't think they knew what to do with this. 
This was the God that they saw bring Lazarus back from the dead. This was the God that they saw calm the storm. This was the God that they saw heal everybody. This was the God that they saw stand up to the Pharisees without blinking an eye. They had seen him do everything. He was the strongest, most courageous person in the world. And he was telling them, I need you. I need you. I am not okay. I need you to stay here with me. You know, the disciples who go with Jesus back in the garden, I've heard so many messages where they get a bad rap because you know they fall asleep. And I got to empathize with them because before this, Jesus was filling them up with bread and wine. I don't know what he expected them to do. He washed their feet too. I'm trying to imagine myself staying awake after getting a foot rub, some bread, and some wine. I'm out, Lord. I'm out. (laughs) But listen to what it says in Luke. It says, when Jesus finished praying, he got up and went to his disciples, and he found them all asleep. Why? For they were exhausted and overwhelmed with sorrow. They loved him. They loved him. They were with him, and he was with them. And he was letting his people know, I'm not okay. What does it do to your heart and mind to know that Jesus had people? He had his tribe. He had his people. And he wanted them to be with him when he was not okay. And listen, this is a question Adam has asked when he talks about community. And I want to ask you tonight, if you don't have community in the good times, guess what you don't have in the bad times? I've walked through some hard, scary nights. And I'll tell you, on those nights, I didn't choose vulnerability. Vulnerability chose me. Because I couldn't mask the pain. I couldn't mask my fear. Vulnerability is risky, but it's worth it. Listen, to be vulnerable can be scary, but to live in pretense is exhausting. To live up to your Instagram It's killing your soul. To show people what's real rather than your real, it's killing your soul. And my question is this, if Jesus was willing to be vulnerable, why aren't you? If Jesus was willing to say, I'm not okay, why aren't you? Listen, I want you to imagine a scene where you're hosting a dinner party at your house and like your favorite celebrity's coming. I don't know who that is for you. And so I'm not even gonna try to guess because I'm the worst. I'm I'm pretty sure it's not Will Smith, but let's just move on. (laughs) I had to. But let's just say you're throwing a dinner party and, and your favorite celebrity's coming over and just imagine yourself right now. You are getting everything ready. If you have kids, you're like, don't breathe. If I see your breath on this table, eat outside. In fact, don't even eat. Fasting is good for you. Just you're, you are, everything is just how you want it to be because it has to be just right. Why? Because you want this person that you value so much to see your very best. Now imagine what happens if they walk into your house and start opening up your closets. Go with God. (laughs) That sends like a chill up your spine, a shiver down your spine. You can't imagine it. We don't want anyone to see inside of our closets. Especially those of us who aren't ones on the Enneagram, we don't label our spices, okay? Do you know what vulnerability is like? Vulnerability is letting someone see into the closet of your soul. And let me tell you the gift that comes with that. When that person walks into your house and sees your closet and says to you, oh, you've got cans of soup from 2014, me too. You haven't figured out how to get your kids to hang their backpacks up? Me too. You don't know how to fold a fitted sheet? Lord Jesus, me too. Vulnerability levels the playing field. Me too. You don't have it all together. Me too. That 
That's why authentic vulnerability is the pathway for freedom in your life because you get to lock eyes with somebody else who's as broken and flawed as you are. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Adam's already said this, but Jesus' community got messy. It got real messy. They were with him and then they weren't. And listen, God showed this to me in scripture this week. And this is why I tell you every time I'm up here, study your Bibles because God shows you things that you've skipped or you've missed. But listen to this. Jesus dies on the cross. He rises from the dead. He's done. He said, it is finished. The work is done. Jesus could have just gone straight up to heaven. He could have come out the grave and just said, here we go. I'm done. These people done drove me crazy. I'm done. But he doesn't leave. Do you know where we find Jesus after his resurrection? He's on the beach making breakfast for the friends who left him. God made them breakfast, even though they didn't get community right. God was done and still needed community. You're not done. You're not done, which means you still need it. You still need it. Here's my question. When are you going to be willing to say yes to God, even though it scares you? When are you going to decide that Jesus knows best and what he's calling you into is the greatest thing that you could ever experience? God doesn't just want you to be vulnerable with others. He wants you to be vulnerable with him. He doesn't want you to wear a mask with him. He wants you to trust him with your peel-infected self. He wants you to understand that you don't have to pretend to be something that you're not. Listen, when I had that peel and then I got that infection, everywhere I went out, I would wear a mask, but I wasn't wearing a mask at home. I just had to keep caking on the medicine and taking the antibiotic. And I have to tell you something, I didn't, I didn't feel pretty at all. And you're like, I know, because you weren't. Like, we don't know how else to tell you. you. I felt ugly. But you know, Adam's love for me didn't change. He didn't treat me any differently. He didn't like keep his distance from me. He continued to love me even though I didn't feel or look very lovable in my own heart and mind. See, Adam's proven his love for me. 22 years, he's proven his love. He's seen me at my worst. I don't have to wear a mask around him. Friend, listen to me. Look at the cross. Jesus has proven his love for you. He doesn't care what's behind your mask. He's not afraid of it. He's not repelled by it. He's not mad that you're going through that thing again. He's not wearied by your brokenness. He's not frustrated by your lack of performance. He loves you just as you are. Jesus loves you just as you are. I want to ask you tonight, what are you carrying? What are you afraid of? What's keeping you at an arm's length? Are you carrying rejection from someone else who told you they loved you and changed their mind? Are you struggling because you can't love yourself, so how could someone else love you? Because you know the real you. Listen to me. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. And he loves you. And he loves the real you. He could care less about your Insta. 
and all of your brokenness and all of your flaws and all of your imperfections, Jesus loves you. And I just wanna ask you, when was the last time you sat in, stayed in, didn't walk away from the truth that you are deeply and completely forever loved by Jesus. Vulnerability starts there. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you right now, right in this moment, to allow this song to be sung over you. The words that say, you made me and you like what you made. I can be real with you. Because you are the one he loves. I am the one he loves. And nothing, nobody can ever take that away from you. So I want to give you a moment with God. I just want you to block distraction. I want you to tune out the voice of the enemy. He's got no place here. He didn't die for your sins. And I want you to let the voice of Jesus wash over you. And as these words are sung, I want you to know that that's Jesus's love song for you. This is how he feels about you. This is his love for you. And I just want you to stay in the moment. Don't leave it. Don't be in a rush. Sit here and be with Jesus. God, in this moment, would you speak In this moment, God, would you make your love and your presence known to each and every one of your beloveds in this room? God, we just want to sit here and be with you. We don't want to go anywhere else. We just want to sit here and be loved and be vulnerable and be real. God, there's nothing like your love, and tonight we just want to revel in it, savor it, sit in it, embrace it. Remind us right now of how much you love us. Father smile and 
You are the one he loves. Zephaniah 3.17 paints this beautiful picture of a father singing over his child. Imagine a young mom sitting in a baby's room late at night, hearing the baby cry, going in, meeting the baby's need and rocking that baby to sleep and just singing a lullaby. The baby is safe, the baby is secure, the baby knows that they are deeply loved and they don't have a care in the world. The problem is we grow out of that room. We grow out of that stage and we learn that the world is a cruel place. And we begin to experience things and hear things that contradict the full unconditional love we knew when we were little. We walk through things, broken relationships, abuse that just keep moving us away from the love that we once knew. I want to tell you tonight, God is calling you back to himself. God is singing over you. God is telling you right now, you are not what happened to you. You are not what someone told you. You are not what someone did to you. You are not what someone took from you. You are the beloved, the chosen, the precious daughter of the Most High King. And when he looks at you, he sees his son and he sees perfection. That's how you are loved. I just want to ask in this space while we sit, sort of with our souls bared to the one who loves us. I'm gonna ask you to be courageous right now. I'm gonna ask you to be real. I'm gonna ask you to be vulnerable. If you walked in carrying something tonight, anxiety or worry, rejection, if you walked in thinking you were fine and through the course of this night, God said, no, 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 no. Can we talk about that thing? I know it's there. I know you're putting on a smile. I know you're putting on a brave face, but I, I know it's there. Can we be real about it right now? Adam said, God loves us through community. God loves us through others. We experience the love of God through others. So here's what I'm gonna ask. If we could bring the lights up a little bit in the house. I'm just gonna ask if you walked in carrying something and you feel weak or tired or frail or afraid. If you just need to be reminded right now of how much God loves you and how much he sees you and how much he's for you, would you just lift a hand across this room? Just lift a hand, don't be afraid. My hand's lifted too. Jesus sees you, Jesus knows you. And here's what I want you to do. Ladies, I want you to look around and if you see someone with their hand up, I want you to put your hand on their shoulder or on their back. That hand on your shoulder, that hand on your back, that is the tangible presence of God right now in your life. That is the tangible good nearness of Jesus to you right now. That hand on your back, that hand on your shoulder is Jesus telling you he loves you. It's Jesus telling you that he's close to you, that he's near you. Jesus is making you a promise tonight and he never goes back on his promises. Jesus is telling you right now, I will never leave you. He may have left, but I'm not going anywhere. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You are mine and I am yours and nothing can separate you from my love. That is what Jesus is saying to you tonight. So Jesus, across this room, you know the story behind every hand that is raised. You know what they're carrying. You know what their struggle is. You know what they're afraid of. And God, right now, would you speak words of love and affirmation over them? Will you remind them that you love them just as they are? 
Will you remind them that you are the God who sees and the God who knows and the God who provides? Will you remind them of their worth? The cross reminds us of our worth to you. The cross reminds us of how deeply and completely we are loved by you. So God, would you right now speak to them? Let them hear your voice. Let them feel your closeness. Let them experience your presence. Invade them with the presence that only you can give. Tell them right now, God, you are not alone. You will never walk alone because I will never leave and I will never forsake you. And remind us right now of what is true about us, that we are chosen, that we are called, that we are beloved, that we are who you say we are. And may we stand and walk in courageous confidence, not because of anything we've done, but because of who you are and what you've called us to be and what you've chosen for us. God, may the women in this room tonight walk out stronger than the way they came in, full of your presence, full of your promise, and full of your truth. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. And I want you to declare these truths over your life. I want you to sing it like you mean it. And if that means you get a little Pentecostal, that's okay. I don't know how Candace has stayed sitting down this whole time at the Keys because she's, I'm just telling you. When we declare the truth of God, we shouldn't stay still. We shouldn't stay quiet. We shouldn't be timid. We shouldn't be afraid. We need to walk and we need to run and we need to skip and we need to dance and we need to throw every inhibition off because Jesus is for us. Jesus loves us. Jesus calls us and he's worthy of our praise. Come on, let's sing.
band's not ready for this, but that's okay. I just need to hear you sing that chorus one more time. And we're gonna raise the roof. And after we finish, y'all are gonna go nuts. Understand? Cause, cause Jesus is worth throwing a party for. Jesus is worth throwing a party for, and we don't need any alcohol to get loose. We just need to let our praise go. So we're gonna sing those words, we're gonna believe those words, and then we're gonna just go crazy, all right? All right, let's do it again. myself back together up here. He's good. He's so good. And he's worth that. He's worth it. He's worth it. Listen, I, I want to introduce you to someone in case you don't know. This is Tiff Perry right here. She is our Cultivate Manager, and she's responsible for leading the teams that have helped create these nights and make them so special. Her and her team have been working so hard, and we want to thank the team right now for all the work that they've done. Yes to create this space. But before you leave, I wanted you to hear from, from Tiff and I want you to hear like from your perspective, what do you want these women to know before they walk out of here tonight? Yeah, uh, I mean, I am so deeply grateful. In the back of my mind, when we start planning these things, I always think it's gonna be me and three people in the room. So I am so grateful that you're here. It was beautiful, wasn't it? It was amazing. You guys, tonight begins and ends with Jesus, and we want you to leave this place tonight wanting more of Jesus in your life. Yeah. And we're gonna help you do that. Starting on April 28th, we're gonna be doing a Bible study in the book of Galatians, and we're gonna learn what it looks like to cultivate a life in Christ. And here's why we're doing this study. So much of what you heard tonight, we hear from women all the time who say, I feel like I can't keep up. I feel like no matter what I do, I'm not enough. And the world has saturated us with these ideas of what our life should look like. And we create these checklists of all the things that we think we need to do in order to be worthy. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to believe that God is keeping score yeah. too. Yep. But this Bible study, it's gonna help us believe exactly what Melody said tonight, that we are deeply and fully known and loved by God. Yeah. We have an incredible team of teachers that know and love Jesus. They wanna share their lives with you. They wanna encourage you. They wanna challenge you. Melody is one of those teachers. Yeah. 
I, I, wanna, I want you guys to know this is, we, I think we have a photo of the teaching team coming up here. Um, these are women that love God, know God, hear from God. They don't want to get up and give you something that they've made up or manufactured. They want to give you the words of Jesus. So you're going to want to be a part of this just to hear from them and let God speak through them to you. They're incredible women um, who who just hear from God. So you don't want to miss that. Tiff, how, what do you want women to do now? You've told Mm -hmm. them about the study. What's their next step? That's right. So we have a study option for every woman and you can join us from anywhere you can do the study if you're in a community group you can do the study with your existing community group you can grab a few friends and do the study at your kitchen table or in your living room or at the break room at work in your dorm room you can do this anywhere our campuses are hosting groups on campus yes so that you can cultivate community with other women. When you leave this room tonight, there's our lobby hallway. There are women there that are ready to answer your questions and help you register. We're gonna put a QR code up on the screen. That code is also in the lobby, it's at the merch booth, it's everywhere out there. You need to register for this study And tonight only, it is $10. You guys, $10 for six weeks that could potentially change your life. You're not getting a better deal than that in 2022. You can't even put gas in your car for $10. That's right. That's right. So when you walk out of this room tonight, we want you to register for this study. Come join us. Cultivate God's word into your life and experience the change that he can create in you from the inside out. So good. You don't want to miss it. So take advantage of the $10. Get registered tonight before you leave. Invite a friend. Invite them into this beautiful world of community and vulnerability. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this experience that you had tonight out into the cold, dark world with you. Be the light and be the love that you've experienced in here. It's no good if we keep it in here. It's only good if we take it out there. Jesus loves you. We love you. And we can't wait to do this again with you guys in a few months. Good night.